Hi, I'm John Waterhouse, and this is the Center for Spiritual Living Summer Prosperity Review for 2020. And I'm glad you're here. Dr. Barber has compiled a number of videos into presentations, and I'm happy to report that people continue to find us online and seem to be prospering their way through these classes and increased income program. I've had lots of people send uh, tithes on money that they've received unexpectedly. Most aren't sending stories for me to share, but many seem to be experiencing improved health, uh, wealth, and happiness, which is the point of the program. So I'm not disappointed at all. Uh, I can report to you that recently there have been participants experiencing several spontaneous improvements in their health. One person is experiencing some unexpected online savings. Uh, which startled and surprised them in a really good way. Another uh, was asked to sell an old refrigerator uh, that had been given to them some time ago. Uh, and when they did, they tithed on that unexpected income. And someone else had debt repaid that they had long since forgotten and did not expect to hear about. So things, good things are happening. And as I say, a lot of other things that I just don't have stories to share for you. Uh, if you're experiencing improved health, if you're having some unexpected flow of any kind in your life, or if you are having something that is making you exceedingly happy suddenly happen in your life, send me a note at john at johnbwaterhouse.com and tell me about it so that I can tell everybody that is coming to these classes about what's happened with you. And as you can see, I'm not going to divulge anybody's name. Uh, just let people know that good things are happening. So it's time to start the class. Uh, but before we do, as we always do, let's do our increased income treatment together and just say this with me aloud. I, John, know that God is the source of all supply and that money is God in action. I know that my good is here now. I am so rich and so full that I have an abundance of money to spare and to share today and always. I know that true prosperity includes perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect happiness. This word, which I speak in faith knowing, now activates universal law, and I accept the results. I bless all that I have now, and I bless the increase. I bless all the others in the increased income program of our class, and I know that we now prosper together in every way. I give thanks for this good, and so it is. Yes. So have a great class, and I'll see you at the end. Everybody ready? Get up! Oh. Are you ready? Yes! Are you ready to prosper? Yes! Are you ready to be rich? Yes! Are you ready to be who you have come here to be? Yes! We're going to do our treatment for prosperity together aloud. I can know that God is the source of all supply and that money is God in action. I know that my good is here now. I am so rich and so full that I have an abundance of money to spare and to share today and always. I know that true prosperity includes perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect happiness. This word which I speak in faith knowing now Bless all.
this uh, this piece that uh, Edward wrote about purpose, I think, was a, a real powerful uh, way to look at purpose. I think he pretty much nailed it, but there's always more to know. How many of you all have a purpose statement? If, if I pointed to you right now, you could recite it to me. Ah, the hands went down. Okay, that's all right. That's good. That's good. If you still have to go look it up and read it, it's not yours yet. So maybe you're still working on it. And we're going to work on it tonight. We're going to talk about this idea of purpose and what that is. It's a powerful notion to, uh, uh, to know why you're here. And that's the idea of purpose. Why were you incarnated on planet Earth at this time in this place? It wasn't an accident. You're not just another uh, drone. You're not just another ant on the hill. You have a purpose. That's this interesting thing about human beings. Um, we, if we observe uh, all the personalities of the animal kingdom on this planet, there are some amazing uh, animals that have personalities and, and have ways of being on the planet. None of them are quite as self-aware, it would appear, than we are. They are very into eating, having, surviving by having food and water, and they're into reproducing. And whatever else they do, and a lot of animals have a lot of entertaining things they do, but they're not quite as, they don't seem, at least from everything that I've studied or read, that they're quite as self-reflective as we are. So we have more responsibility here because of that. We are not just here to use up the resources on the planet and die. That's not what's, what this is about. We're here to bring something to the whole, every one of us. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to bring it to everyone. There aren't many people on the planet that get to do that. But you are here to bring something to some population of people, some group of people, for some purpose. There's something about that. Yes? Hey, yeah. Speaking of that, I, I love what he wrote on page 75. He says, Hang on, hang on. I won't be able to hear you on the recording. Just on that topic, on page 75, he says, Moreover, as the success of our life here upon the earth is to be determined by the extent to which we fulfill our destiny. Right, and we have a destiny. And anybody thinks you don't, thinks you're just here, and you do what you do, and then you're gone, is not, is not being realistic. That's not what this is about. Thank you. It's about more than that. Let's talk about what your purpose is not, so you don't get confused. Those of you that don't have a purpose statement aren't confused about what it's not. It's not your job. Now, your job may would likely be in alignment with your purpose, but it's not your job, okay? It's also not your roles in life. It's not being a mother or a father or a, or a spouse or uh, anything of the sort. And there are many roles that we play. And it's not that the roles aren't involved in your purpose, but they're not singularly your purpose. So no one writes a, a, a statement, uh, my purpose is to be a good mother of my children. That's not it. There's something more for you to know about yourself. And it is not your accomplishments. It's not your degrees. It's not your, uh, it's not your salary. It's not your bank account. Those things are not your purpose. Purpose is something deeper than that, something more powerful than that, something more personal than that. So let's look at the essence of purpose. Here's something to know. You already have your purpose. You're not looking for it. Now, you may want to learn how to articulate it. You may want to learn how to share the idea of your purpose with others. That can be very valuable. But it's not that you've been droning through life and, and said, suddenly you're going to find your purpose. When you can articulate your purpose, you are better able to identify with it and to, and to assess how you're relating to it. But it's in, in and of itself, it's not something that you're, that you're looking for. You're only, if anything, you're looking for how to express that purpose. That would be it. Uh, well, yes, ma'am. Well, uh, wouldn't it also be uh, you're learning to recognize your purpose? That's fine. You can learn to recognize your purpose. Many people don't. Yeah. They have no idea. That's right. So. Mm -hmm. so you have no clue that's what your purpose Well, that's why you come to this class, right? <laughs> now, all those people that aren't here tonight, you know, we can, we can wonder about that. <laughs> <laughs> there 
There you go. There you go. So uh, you already have a purpose. That's not on the table. It's a direction, not a destination. It's not like you achieve your purpose and then you're done and you go home. That's not how it works. In fact, most people at, that, that are clear about why they're on the planet have many plans that will be planned out far beyond their lifetimes because they don't know how not to do that. I remember hearing uh, uh, Osteen. What's his first name? Joel. Joel Osteen talking about his father. And his father was, was dealing with, with illness, and they would sit and talk, and he would talk about all his plans. That's what he wanted to talk about, because he was so clear about his purpose in life. And trust me, Joel Olstein would not be who he is today had he not had the father he had that gave him the guidance and the clarity to be who he is today. So uh, that was a, that's a team effort. So the idea that, that you will get to it to your purpose it, it is irrelevant. That's not what it is. It's a direction. It's how you assess your, your uh, value in life, your uh, worthwhileness, your being on the planet. It's, it's really, uh, in a way, a justification for you to be here. And it's really good to be able to say that. What is this? Aligning with your purpose feels good. What does that mean? Well, there are times when we feel good, right? And there's times when we don't feel good. When we don't feel good, when we're angry, upset, confused, or anything of the sort, we're not being in alignment with our purpose. If, if those of you that have done the uh, membership class know, uh, uh, we, we do this, this exercise where you write down your, your uh, a different kind of name for yourself. And we tell people to be on their name tag. When you're not on your name tag, it's pretty easy to see because you're not happy. You're not enjoying your life. You're not feeling valued and valuable. And you, you know you're not bringing much. And the same thing is true for this idea of purpose. When you are in alignment with your purpose, when the things that you are doing in your life are in alignment with that reason that you are here, you feel validated, you feel uh, valued, you feel a part of life in a good way. And when you feel crummy, and I'm not talking about being, you know, getting cold crummy. I'm talking about when you have that deep sense of loss or confusion or, or you don't feel like you're getting anything out of life, you're obviously not aligned with your purpose. You're not doing things and acting according to your purpose. You're not thinking in alignment with your purpose. You're doing something else, which usually includes things like being in judgment, finding fault, uh, blaming, all that stuff. That's, nobody has that, those kinds of things in their purpose. That's not why we're here. And yes, we all fall into that abyss now and again. And I'm not saying that you should never uh, have, a, have a hard day. That happens. But understand that the reason you're having the hard day is that because the things you're focused on are not in alignment with why you're here. And if you want to get back into alignment with why you're here, that will change. It comes automatically. I've, I've been in, in those circumstances of my life where I felt lost and I didn't know how to deal with something. And I realized that there was a reason for me to be where I was doing what I was doing. And when I focused on that, I immediately pulled myself out of it. It wasn't hard. It seemed impossible when I was in it. But getting out of it is simply to realign. Know who you are. This is why I'm here. I remember. And to do that, and then everything feels fine. It doesn't necessarily in that moment mean all your bills are paid and uh, everything that you've got to get done is done. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about simply knowing why you're here and acting on that. And the last one, only you can know your purpose. Nobody can tell you your purpose. I love my story of finding that. I was uh, in my early 20s uh, and I went to my very first paid for public seminar. And it was on time management. And it was led by this great guy that, I, that was from Utah. He was a Mormon. I think he had close to a dozen kids. And he, was, he talked about purpose. First time I heard that conversation. And it wowed me. And there were like, I don't know, maybe 1,500, 2,000 people in this grand ballroom at a hotel in downtown, or actually it was in the west part of Houston. And during the break, 
I worked my way up to the front. I wanted to, he read it, but I couldn't remember what he said. So I wanted to get up there and I wanted to read his purpose and really get it because maybe it was mine too. <laughs> I did my best and I read it. I think I read it three times before I let him have his book back, his planner back, but, uh, but it didn't stick. And so I wrote something and it didn't quite feel right. I, I realized, as I mentioned earlier, that you can't, uh, if you can't, say it. If you can't just say it, then it's really not your purpose. You haven't articulated it well enough yet. you got to keep working on it. And that's what I would have to do if it ever came up. I have a purpose. Hold on. I'll go get it. <laughs> and that was, uh, that was not good enough. That did not work for me. And then later in my life, I was uh, enamored with uh, Robert Schuller and uh, watched the uh, Hour of Power and uh, had this fixation about the Crystal Cathedral. You know, I actually spoke at the Crystal Cathedral. Wow. I was the only one in there, but I was so <laughs> It was a glorious moment. I was in there. But he would often talk about his, and just from remembering his was about creating something out of nothing. Oh, I love that idea. He created a lot out of nothing. Uh, and I just won't. So I tried to work with that. That was nothing. And I can't tell you what day it happened. I don't know where I was, I don't remember any of the details of the moment, but at one moment, I absolutely was clear. My purpose is to reveal and release the divine presence within everyone that I meet. That's it. That's who I am. That's my job. And if I'm doing that, I'm doing it. I was at uh, my yoga class, my midday yoga class today. It's a men's yoga class. And we have a, uh, uh, a very charismatic teacher. He's a young man. He's going to actually be 34 years old tomorrow. And uh, after class, uh, he and I and one other guy uh, were cleaning up. And uh, at one point, he said, you know, I won't go into anything to have my own yoga studio. But it's so hard. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why does it have to be hard? And I was like in his face saying, you're a genius at this. You make people want to do this. <laughs> Yoga is not just all that much fun. <laughs> you make it fascinating. You have a genius for this. Why are you making it hard? And he said, you're right. No more hard. That's finding the presence of God within somebody. That's what I do. That's what I love to do. That makes me happy. And any time I get to do that, like right now, I feel like I'm living my purpose. So it doesn't get any better than this. This is my life. This is what I love. And it, it's wonderful to do it here. It was wonderful for those six years to do it other places in the world. And I'll probably do it other places again. It's wonderful. Now, do I, do I have to always say that this is about revealing the, the divine presence or God presence in, in everything? Of course not. Because I may be working in a secular environment. But the message is the same. It may have a few different words in it. It may be articulated slightly different. But that's my purpose. So I will do that whether it's with a secular audience, a spiritually conscious audience, or anybody else, or any individual. That's how it works. So this is the essence of purpose. It is time for us to take a break. We're going to come back and work on this. Thank you. So if you go Google purpose, We've got 152,000 things to read. <laughs> and I'm only going to read you one. This comes from the book, The Illuminated Rumi, translations uh, by Coleman Barks. And this piece is called The Work. The real work. The real work. There is one thing in the world that you must never forget to do. If you forget everything else and not this, there's nothing to worry about. But if you remember everything else and forget this, then you have done nothing, nothing in your life. Think you believe in this? Ooh. It's as if a king had sent you to some country to do a task, and you perform a hundred other services, but not one of the ones he sent you to do. So human beings come to this world to do particular work. That work is the purpose and each is specific to the person. If you don't do it, it's as though a priceless Indian sword were used to slice rotten meat. Mm. It's a golden bowl being used to cook turnips, 
And one filing from that wool would buy a hundred suitable pots. It's a knife of the finest tempering nailed into a wall to hang things up. You say, but look, I'm using the dagger. It's not lying idle. Do you hear how ludicrous that sounds? For a penny, an iron nail could be bought to serve that purpose. You say, but I spend my energies on lofty enterprises. I study jurisprudence and philosophy and logic and astronomy and medicine and all the rest. But consider why you do these things. They are all branches of yourself. Remember the deep root of your being, the presence within you. Give your light to the one who already knows your breath and your moments. If you don't, you will be exactly like the man who takes a precious dagger and hammers it into his kitchen wall for a peg to hold his dipper gourd. You'll be wasting valuable keenness and foolishly ignoring your dignity and your purpose. Wow. Nice illustrations, huh? Little gory, but it really does speak to it. So I want you all to be able to speak your purpose. And I think we can do it by, by asking you a very small amount of questions as soon as I find this. So what we're going to look at here is creating a purpose statement. Let me give you the criteria before we get working on it. A purpose statement is concise. It's not long and complicated. It's concise, short, never more than a sentence. It captures your spirit. It's about you. You may be using the same kinds of words that somebody else uses, but it's about you. And it means what it means because of you. It reveals your passion, your genius, the thing that makes it specific and particular to you. It's what's important to you. And you know, this thing about language, I've long realized that, like, that the English language is the one I know is, is, is ineffective in some ways. So sometimes the words don't really do it. But yet there are ways to evoke something through words. And that's what you're seeking to do here. A purpose statement is easy to understand. A 12 year old should be able to go, got it. Notice I didn't say a six year old, but maybe that too. <laughs> and it reflects your heart and your mind. The, the cohesion of those two ideas. What you feel and what you think. All right, so that's the criteria for creating a purpose statement. Now we're going to go into these questions that I told you about. Four questions. You have to have something to write on because you don't want to write. Can you, can you I'll do it later. Just leave a little space for that, okay? Ready for question number one? What are we here to do, be, have, or give? What are you here to do, be, have, or give? And the have, I, I want to speak to specifically. It's not about having money. It's, if, if you use the word have in, in your statement, then it, it's about the gift you have to give to the world. All right? What are you here to do, be, have, or give? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Most of you know right away. You know what, you're, what you, you've come here to give. You have, a, you have something that's yours to give. And we're going to do four questions. This is the only one that's about you. So you need to know particularly what it is that you have to give you. What's your genius? What's your passion? What's the thing that you could teach others about in a very uh, specific way, in a very genuine way? There's something in you. What is that? Okay, any questions about that one? Nope. Who are you here to serve? Who's your population? Who are the people that would most benefit from what you have to do, be, have, or give? Any questions? Anybody not able to answer that? Okay, good. Wow, that's impressive. Okay, well, we may look at that here in a few minutes if you really get stuck there, okay? Yeah. Okay. 
Who are you here to serve? Question three. What do those you serve seek or desire? What makes them the population? You may have already stated that in the, in the answer to the second question, but maybe not. <coughs> So the answer come to you with that one? Anybody struggling with that one? That's good. This is fine. We don't have to answer these two. Well, I'm, I'm hoping people do, Jim, but I'm not holding you to that. To it, okay? okay? What can those you serve get from you? So it may be that you have a way of assisting people to achieve something. They're not looking necessarily for you but it is because of your expertise and your skill and your, uh, your genius and your passion that you can be a catalyst for them having, getting what it is they want through you because of what you know. Those are your four questions. So, still, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this for, for me. Just kind of see how mine fits here. What are you here to do, be, have, and give? I'm here to re reveal and release the power of divine presence. That's what I do. Who are you, those you serve? Anyone I come into contact with. That's my, that's my audience. Anybody that will look my way, right? For some people, it's, it's a totally different thing. But in my case, it's whoever will listen to me, whoever will interact with me. And that's real for me. I remember when I, when I uh, began my spiritual quest in uh, Australia, one of the things that we had to go do as part of the spiritual community was go out on the streets of Sydney and engage people in a conversation and then invite them to come to a lecture. That was part of the deal. If you were going to work there, that was part of the deal. And you spent a certain number of time every week going out on the streets, into the parks, into the, into the common areas of Sydney, Australia, and say, hi, can I talk to you for a minute? And have a conversation about the, the spiritual community that I was part of. I hated doing that. I hated doing that. But as soon as the people were in the room, I could get in front of them and talk to them. Because at that level, I had an agreement. They, they were willing to listen to me. I wasn't interrupting them. I wasn't trying to buy for their attention. They were here. They were looking this way. I'm good with that. But I really struggled with the other. Toward the end of my, my year there, I actually got to where I was pretty good at that. But I never really liked it. Because, well, it's that old thing that we all have, uh, the idea of being rejected. And I'm sure in my life, even with people standing in a room, people have gone, I don't think so. You know, and didn't did reject whatever it was I was teaching or sharing. But on the street, one on one, that was hard for me. So this idea of, of knowing who I serve, I want some level of agreement with those people that they'd like to hear what I have to say and that they might, might possibly get something out of it. So let's answer number three. What do those you serve seek or desire? I believe that everyone on the planet desires a better life. Now, there may be folks around that go, now, I got everything I could ever need. Short of my next breath, I, I'm just set for life. OK, great. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Most of us want something more. Most of us are looking, seeking for some deeper understanding or a, a clearer knowing of who we are, whatever, however you want to say it. Everybody's got some level of secret. And I think that's healthy to always be open to it. Ernest Holmes is open to it. He said the moment he found a better uh, understanding than the science of mind, he would drop it like a, a, a rock <laughs> and pick the new one up, but he never did. So, but he was a seeker, so he was willing to look. And he, he was a voracious reader, looking to see if it was there. I believe that everyone seeks and everyone desires, and that most of us would like to have a better life, or we feel better about ourselves, and we, and we are more attuned to the life that we're living. And then the final one is, what can those you serve get from you? I believe in the teaching that we teach the science of mind. I believe that the divine presence dwells at the point of mind. I have no doubt of that. Have I fully engaged that to the point where, as Sai Baba would say, uh, he understood that he was God and most of us don't? Probably not as far as, as, as I would like. 
probably not as far as I will through the rest of this lifetime. But I know it pretty well. And I believe it. And I use it every day. So I do have that. And I do believe that that's what people can get from me, a sense of self-confidence that there's something in me. And I've decided that the way you teach this to a secular audience is to tell them that there's a power within them. You don't have to call it God. But there's a power within you to create a life far beyond anything you know, anything you understand. And frankly, I can say that to you. Because all of us have work to do on that understanding that there's a power within us to create that we are just beginning to tap into. That's the work. That's the thing that we will use to change the world. When everyone realizes they have the ability to have a meaningful, purposeful, loving, successful life. When we all know that, and we all live according to that, we will have found peace. Yeah. So there's value in, for me in what I do. There's value in you and what you do and what your purpose is. So as you answer these questions, they actually create a statement. And if you start it with the, your name or my purpose is, and then put link the answers you gave to those four questions, you'll be very close to, to constructing a purpose statement. Now, sometimes we, we have these lovely phrases, not everybody, but if you think about mine, uh, uh, my purpose is to reveal and release the power of divine presence wherever I am and whatever I do. When I say that, it's a little wordy. It's a little uh, uh, lofty. So what is it that we could say that would capture the essence of that without having to make it sound quite as lofty as, as it can? So here's what I want to take, is what you've gotten from this, as valuable as it is, let's con uh, uh, hone it down to something even simpler. And we do that with, a, with one more question. How many of you have been asked that question? <laughs> so what do you do? What do you do? And the answer is? <laughs> yeah, some of us have that kind of answer to breezy eyes, whatever I want. Uh, but some of us so relate to, to the title or the, the thing that we do in the world. Maybe not you, but my easy answer was, well, I'm a minister. Or I'm the president of an international spiritual organization. Or, you know, something like that. What if you reframed that? And instead of being that, you gave like this elevator phrase of what your purpose is. Mm -hmm. And so I have some examples. If by chance you were uh, a high school calculus teacher, you might say, I teach kids how to think abstractly. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? Yeah. If you were a clothing designer, you might say, I help people look and feel their best. If you were an auto mechanic, you might say, I help people maintain safe and reliable transportation. It doesn't get into the mechanics of it. It doesn't get into the minutia of it. It's an idea of this. What's what I came here to do? And all work is, is noble. So it's not like some way of expressing the world is less valuable than another. You know, I, uh, if someone worked in hospice, I honor people at the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. What do you want to say? Cool, that's, you know, I, <laughs> you're so, you're I, 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 Talk. I want to, and uh, perhaps I will. Okay, all right. right now, because it's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I hear you. Yeah. So uh, I can say, I reveal the presence of God in everyone I meet. That's my, that's my purpose. That's what I do. So I guess my question, I can't ask this, yes. is that initially, and I've struggled with this, and we've done this before, right. Right. because it always seems to get pulled from occupation. Yeah. 
And so the examples you use there are occupationally driven, that's true. Right. And, and so what do you do when you change? Well because that's part of life. Right. Yeah. But I I was gonna ask and I think I know the answer already. There are probably, although you worded those really well, I'll never be a calculus teacher, so I'm not going to be teaching children abstract <laughs> stuff. But like for nursing, yeah. example, I mean that's a compassion, you know, field. So it's hard to all these questions as I asked, as I was trying to answer them, go back to that nursing. Experience. Sure, and there's no, it's not an accident, Dee, that you chose nursing as your career. Uh, and it's no accident that you're, uh, you're looking at this so deeply right now in your life. Um, going back to the idea that when you're living your purpose, you're happy. Uh, I support people uh, through their physical challenges. You know, however you want to say it, just this little phrase that says what I do in the world without tying me to a certain particular job. Right, okay. You know, mm -hmm. because, and here's the way you can know it too, when you come up with something like that, look back in your life. And hasn't that been present all along? Mm -hmm. Haven't you done that? And when you did that, even if it was by accident, weren't you having a brilliant time of it? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that wonderful? I, I remember being in high school and, and being in, in ways of lifting other people up. And, and how good that felt. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what I was doing. But <clears throat> when, I, when I told someone on the, on the football team with me that that was a, an amazing tackle, that lifted them up. You know, whatever it is, whatever you say. <clears throat> so basically, my job now is to always go out of my way to say something to the people around me that lifts them up because that's their divine presence. That's the essence of who they are. Mm -hmm. There was a guy in yoga today. I'd never met him before. His name is George. Uh, and there's a place where we do uh, uh, inversions, they're called. You yogis know that. That means that you get your feet up above your heart. Uh, mine is very simple. I put a block under my, uh, my pelvis and raise my feet. It's lovely. <laughs> the guy next to me did a full headstand without touching the wall or anything. And I looked over and I went, that's amazing. So when we were done and I greeted him, I said, that was just an amazing headstand. He said, I haven't done one of those in a long time. I said, well, you've got the touch because that was just spectacular. And he smiled and, and accepted. And it really was. You know, to have that level of balance is incredible to me. I'm working on some pretty basic balancing things, so, and, and it's all good, and, and that's the joy of being in this group, is there's no pressure to do anything a certain way. Anyway, um, how this applies to your life, only you can know. I would ask you, though, who has, from this little exercise we just did, uh, a phrase, a short little phrase, that you would say if someone said to you, what do you do? Who's got one? Yeah. Uh, to be of love and service in the world. Thank you. Judith. Reveal the life with, within each other. Revealing the light within myself and others. Ah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Create a sustainable world one home at a time. There you go. Mm -hmm. One home at a time. Good for you. So your your population are home buyers. No, it's the world. A home is more than just a house. That's right. That's true. That's true. Oh, good for you. Good for you. That's good for you. Very nice. Rhonda? I help people know that anything is possible. Very nice. Lynn? I teach money, magic, and manifestation. I teach money, magic, and manifestation. That's absolutely true. You do. <coughs> See how easy this is when you let it be? So find your statement. Find your little friends. I mean, it's lovely if you want to do that, that more formal uh, statement, but don't think you have to. It's okay. All right. What we got next? Yay! Secret eight. Foresight. <laughs> Wasn't this an interesting conversation? Uh, Fenwick says that foresight equals intuition and judgment. So I'm not crazy about the word judgment, so I changed it. Discernment. Better. Synonymous with judgment, but it takes out the idea that I would judge someone. Right. So 
uh, the intuition uh, equals foresight equals intuition and discernment. So what would that mean? Well, Barbara talked about about intuition, and intuition is is the key starting point of this. Every one of us has within us the ability to be intuitive. Most people don't know how. In fact, in neurolinguistic programming, uh, they divide people into two camps. The camp of people uh, that are called sensates, who relate to life through their senses, and people who are intuitive, who relate to life through their sixth sense, intuition, and their hunches and such. Yes, Jim? Would I move? Okay, but if I move too far, I'm off camera, so maybe I'll just move back a little bit. Okay. So, um, the reason I tell you that is because this does not come natural to many people. Actually, I think that the intuitive population is about 26%, and the, uh, the sensei population is about, what, 74%, something like that. So uh, most people on the planet love to deal with things that they can see, hear, touch, taste, and feel. Where if you're intuitive, and most of the people that come to this place are, can move into those abstract ideas that we teach because you can think beyond your physicality. So I believe that this is easier for people who are intuitives to use that intuition and make it work. And these skills can be developed. This idea of foresight is not a word we use a lot these days, but it's a word, uh, it's an idea of forward looking, being, uh, uh, engaging the future, the idea of we're going somewhere, there's something to accomplish. So the way I've kind of interpreted this whole idea of foresight is, so what do you do with your purpose? You use it, and you do something, you create something, you move forward in your life in a way that is meaningful to people. So how you develop a skill that would do that? Uh, the the uh, great teacher Ram Das says, be here now. Great, yes, be here now. But it's, there's something good about kind of thinking about where we're going so that we have some <coughs> movement in that direction. It takes some thought. Where do you start? Do you start with your desires? Well, actually, I think we're going to actually start working before we get to that. We're going to start with really looking at how life is working. Oh, no, I want to do the four benefits first. Okay, these are the benefits of having foresight. We adapt better to change if we have foresight. Because change kicks a lot of people's butts. Oh, crap, I wasn't expecting that. You know? So the idea of being able to adapt to change is very valuable in anybody's life. We feel more confident because we've kind of thought about where we're going. We have some sense of it. We, nobody's got it all written down. In fact, the joke is, uh, uh, God laughed while we made plans. But the truth is, there's value in making plans. Does everything work out like it was supposed to? No, we'll talk about that. But the idea of being confident and moving forward is, I have some idea, even if I made it up, about where I'm going. And that gives me some sense of confidence. We tend to avoid conflicts. Sure, we're too busy creating the thing we want to create the world. So we we do a good job of avoiding getting into challenges that don't serve us in getting there. We don't have the time for it. We don't have the interest in it because it's like uh, Nehemiah up on top of the wall in Jerusalem when the people saying, we've got to work all this out now and you've got to come down and talk to us. I will not come down. I have, important, I have a great work to do. I'm doing a great work. That's what he said. I'm doing a great work. What a lesson. I'm focused on my purpose. You guys work out the details. I know what I'm doing. Okay. And four, we discover new opportunities because we're looking for them. Because that's what we want to do. We want to create opportunities for ourselves and others. So that's what we do. So those are the benefits. Now we can talk about these 12 techniques for sharpening your foresight. And just let these wash over you. Don't get crazy about this. Don't get too intense. Uh, I'm going to share some stuff on each of them. Uh, and the ones that really work for you, go. Use them. Make it part of your plan. Those that don't, don't let's not get concerned. I don't need anyone to tell me why one of them is wrong. Okay. So 12 techniques. Here's the first one. 
conduct an honest personal inventory. <laughs> Twelve steppers are going, yeah. I know that. <laughs> and that's kind of what this is. It's, it's an idea of take a point in time like now. I'm not asking you to do this right now, but I'm saying take a point in time where you sit down and really look. Where am I going? What's, what's the plan here? Some people will go, I don't have a plan. I'm freaking out. Other people will go, well, I really, I know what I, I want, but it's not quite happening. Or anything else that you might come up with that. You may go, I'm going gangbusters and getting what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe. Uh, I, what I've realized recently, if, if, if I would sit down and take that personal inventory, if I had done that, uh, let's say a month ago, where I had drugged my feet and drugged my feet on doing the, the videotaping for my website, because I was distracted and I let myself be distracted by all these other things, and then I said, it's time, and I called Yvonne and she said, yeah, we're going to do that when we get back from Italy in October. <laughs> now, could I blame Devon for that? I could try, but it really wouldn't work. It was me. Because I could have had those things done. Now, that sounds a little like blame. I don't want to go there. What I have to do is make peace with October. And let October be okay. Yeah. We'll, do the, we'll do the filming in, in October, and it'll work out. Because it's okay. But that's the point of the inventory is... How am I doing at this? At a starting point, how am I doing at creating the outcomes that I desire? Everybody's got an answer for that. Everybody's different. Nobody's wrong and nobody's failed. Remember we had that talk about failure early on? There's really no way to do that because you always get an outcome. You get something. And you created the thing you got. So you always get success. Even if it's something you don't want. Okay, that's one. Conduct an honest personal inventory. Look at where you are. Let's see if there's anything on my notes that I need to say. The qu here's another part of the question. Uh, are you applying your genius to moving forward in your life? Some of us are. Some of us could do more of that. What thoughts, activities are hampering your ability to move forward? Procrastination probably, we made a list, would be the first one. But there's, there's stuff. Distractions. Uh, uh, family matters, and the list can go on and on and on. There's always reasons. And we're going to talk about how, to, how hopefully to change that done as we go through these 12. This is one. Oh, we better move here. Dream big is number two. What's the sense of having a life and not to have a big dream? And the dream isn't about getting a yacht or a plane. The dream is about how you're making a difference in the world. That's what's important. How are you making a difference? in the world, in the, in the population that you are here to serve. Envision your, envision your future being brilliantly successful because you brought it into being. Your future is not something that is happening to you. Without dreams, there will be no results. Let your dreams impress you. And Wayne Gaines says, if your palms aren't sweating, you're not dreaming big enough. <laughs> Think about how different your life will become when you realize your dream. As you're realizing your dream, not the way until it's here. I think my life is better when I'm focused and moving forward. It does not have to be the end. I don't have to have the goal achieved. That's not it. It's, it's, it's the, the journey. That's what it's about. So that's number two, your big dream. Turn your dreams into intended outcomes. So this is why this is important. I reject the term goals. Because some goals are, are met, some are not. You always get outcomes. Now, you could, you could not get it quite the way you intended, but what I often find is that people are being vigilant at focusing on creating certain outcomes in their lives. And I'm talking about short-term, medium-range, and long-range uh, outcomes. When you start laying that out, how that's going to build on where you want to go, you're going to get an outcome. It may not look exactly like you were planning. It may look better. There may be things that you learned along the way that made it better than you even thought. But the idea of having foresight is that you've got to set some, some stepping stone points 
in time where you're going to achieve some stuff along the way to get to the place that you're going. Your purpose is a direction. All this stuff needs to align with your purpose. But you have to decide what the steps are. So I love calling them intended outcomes. That's a very definitive way for me to know. They're not goals. Write them down in order of priority or importance to you. That means write them all down and then prioritize. What's the most important thing? And then do the short, medium, and long range. Make certain each one is in alignment with your purpose. I have found sometimes in my life I've gotten focused on something that was not in alignment with my purpose. And it either crumbled before my very eyes or it put up blocks because it really wasn't for me to do. I liked the idea of it, but it really wasn't part of my reason for being here. So it was a distraction, even though it was juicy and interesting. So in alignment with your purpose. And one thing I love to do with intended outcomes is set a date. And I know when we treat, we treat, we teach everyone in treatment, it's about right now. You see, you treat, I have it now, it is here now. Everything is in the now moment, and that's absolutely true. But when you're doing this work, it's progressive. And you want to know when you're going to get that, that, those steps done. When are you going to get, uh, when will you be at the place where you're totally functioning in the outcome you desire that, that is in line with your purpose? But there's usually these steps that are required beforehand. For me, it's getting videos on my website so that I can put my website up so that I can receive uh, in invitations to come speak to groups. That's the order of things. So I got to do those things to get this thing to work. And that's a good thing, but I know it. Some people don't know what they have to do to make it work. They just know they have this longing for this outcome in their life. And it's in alignment with the purpose, so it's a great thing to do, but they've never done it before and they don't know how to do it. Isn't that great? It's great that it's that way because that's calling you to be as big as your dream. And all of us need to grow into our dream because we don't today know how to be there or we'd be there. So we've got to grow in the mix, in the plan. Okay, number four. Consider relevant risks. Oh, you're a religious scientist. Why are you talking about risks? Because it's good to be pragmatic. I'm not asking you to worry about anything, but it's great to think about what if we run out of money? Uh, what if the, if the principal player gets hit by a bus? I mean, you wouldn't want to say that to somebody, but you want to, be, you want to know that this is going to work, even as the pieces might change. And you want to think about, just, just give some relevance to the idea that it's not going to all be like you planned. It's going to have different things in it. And what happens is if you don't do that, when that thing shows up, you think, I'm screwed. I don't know what to do now. Whereas if you had thought about the idea of things not being the way you planned, yet you still have every intention to achieve that outcome, that you're ready to take it on, whatever it is. There's real value in, in looking at what your risks are. It's not a downer. It will help you. You want to say something, Dakota? Yeah. In, in my life, we, we call it plan B, C, and D. <laughs> because whatever the eventuality is, you got to plan for it. It's okay. There you go. That's, that's a great way to look at it. Uh, this is not about worrying. I said this. It's not about making smart choices. It's about making smart choices. That thing that Barbara talked about, the railroad uh, builder that, uh, that decided on Port Arthur instead of Galveston, that was intuitive. Yet he did his research. It was, it was an interior, uh, Port Arthur is, a, is an interior uh, uh, port. So you've got to go up a waterway to get to it. And it actually made it a safer place to load and unload cargo. So in the long run, it really worked. If you've ever been to, to Galveston, it's right on, on the Gulf. And it's not protected. And that was a, a brilliant move that was pragmatic because he had looked at the risk factors and made his choices accordingly. It, it's not a waste of time. So let's do number five. Look at the patterns in your life. This is a fascinating look. So how do you look at the patterns in your life? Well, here's some questions that might help. When have you been successful in your life? 
How did it happen? How are your successes similar to one another? What are the, what are the common threads of your successes? Who were you? Who did you believe you were? How did you conduct yourself? What did you have as your objective? How are those things similar with the different successes you've had in your life? How have you not been successful in your life? When have things not worked out the way that you wanted? How did that happen? Most times you want to point to somebody else. I invite you in this exercise, if you do this, don't talk about anybody but you. It wasn't about your business partner. It wasn't about your spouse. It wasn't about uh, the economic climate at the time. It was about you. Has this happened more than once that you were not successful at something? How did it feel when it happened? Did it feel that way with each time that it didn't work out? Now the reason to do that is not to dwell on what didn't work, it's actually to recognize what you're moving away from, what you're working toward is the idea of success, but it's okay to realize that some things don't turn out the way we expect it. And if we can identify within us what we did to contribute to that, let's not do that again. Let's do something else. Are there concerns that come up over and over again that aren't being addressed in your life? Concerns that people say to you, concerns that you have for yourself. What are your, what's your internal dialogue? Are there judgments that you have of yourself? If you do, Maybe it's time to reconcile them, to rectify them, and taking a stand to do something else rather than that. Do you tend to have repetitive fears or confusion about what's going to happen? If you do, talk to a practitioner, <laughs> because none of that stuff will help you. How can you reframe concerns into affirmations? I got my little story on that is that for years I had a, a miserable habit of twisting my ankle, of just having my ankle go over and me put up all my weight down on, on the side of my foot and, and fall to the ground writhing in pain. My, my ankle would swell up. And it was like, how does this happen? How can I walk across an entire parking lot and hit the only piece of chunk of asphalt that's out of place and twist my ankle and end up down on the ground writhing in pain? How does that happen again and again? Well, there's no answer for that. That's not the approach to take. The approach to take is to turn that challenge into an affirmation. And what I began to say to myself on an ongoing basis every day is my ankles are strong. My ankles are healthy. My ankles support my weight easily. And it all stopped. Hmm. It all stopped. So if there's something that you're seeing that seems to be getting in your way as a pattern over and over again, create an affirmation that counteracts that. And make that your mantra for a while. And see if it doesn't just go away. Consult with trusted advisors. This is a little tricky. That doesn't mean tell everybody everything you're doing. It means have a small cadre of people you trust. You have to decide who that is. Your partner may or may not be in that group. You decide. It's, but the idea of what these people are doing, the reason you trust them, is that they have your best interest at hand. They want the best for you. They believe in you. And they will tell you the truth. Because if you're doing something that's stupid, somebody's got to tell you. And often you're blinded to it. You can't see that you're doing this thing that's creating this problem. But they can. So you ask them to support you. You ask them to believe in you. And you ask them to be honest with you. So that you get the feedback. So that you can clean up whatever's not working in your consciousness. We all have stuff. Anybody disagree with that? Let's see. They can be friends, they can be business associates, but they see how you really behave in the world. And they can be honest with you about that and reveal that to you. Uh, here's a question. Who can help you achieve your desired outcomes by being honest and loving? That's what you're looking for. So when you connect with col colleagues, 
in your line of work or in, in your social group or whatever it is, uh, I think people that understand uh, what's going on in your world and can support you with it. That's six. Ooh, happy now. Seven, pay attention to the little things you do. It's amazing how little things can make such, make such a major difference. Have like so many uh, yoga metaphors. <laughs> we'll be doing a pose, and it'll be a hands up thing. And the teacher will say, Turn your hands over. You feel how that feels different in your back. <laughs> a little thing, yet it makes a difference. And life is filled with these things. The little choices you make every day add up over time. How do you spend your time? <clears throat> Do you act on it uh, on your big dreams at least once during the day? Do you do something every day that touches that? Do you think about it? I didn't make a slide on this, uh, but it's worth talking about. It's Stephen Covey's priority matrix. Where you've got four quadrants. One is important and urgent. One is important and not urgent. One is not important but urgent. One is not important and not urgent. He makes this so simple and so clear. If it's not important to not urgent, throw it away. It doesn't matter. Just because somebody sent you something in the mail or an email does not mean that you have to use your time for something that's not important to you and not urgent. Uh, if it's not important but urgent, and what would that be? The phone ringing. When the phone's ringing, many people will stop whatever they're doing, helping a customer or whatever, and they'll answer the phone. And they'll stay on the phone talking for a long time while you're standing there in the middle of some kind of interaction with them right. because they think that's more important. It's not. It's urgent because it's ringing. And it's good to have a system where the phone gets answered, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop what you're doing every time. Important but not urgent. Those are the big things. Because the big dream is not urgent. It's lovely, but it's not urgent. There's nothing urgent about it. But it's really, really important. Those are the ones that get missed the most. And obviously the ones that are important and urgent are the ones that get hammered the most. So that's easy. But the important ones that aren't urgent is the little game there. Oh my god, I gotta keep going. <laughs> Stay motivated and engaged. Be mindful of the long-term benefits of achieving your intended outcomes. Keep reminding yourself that these uh, of your future rewards practice delayed gratification. Do what you need to do today so that you can get the benefit down the road. Set aside time to think on where you're going and what you're creating every day. Always be open to change. We're going over by a few minutes tonight. Thank you for your patience with me. Always be open to change. This is really important. Not everything looks like we expect it to look. Even as you want things to happen, sometimes some things happen differently. It's okay. Be flexible. Be able to go with it. Be able to take those changes and make them work for you. How many times has that happened where, where I, I, I expected an outcome, I got something different, and if I would just take the time to look at what I got, I'd go, that's freaking better. That's better than I had imagined, but I didn't see it. So give it a chance and be open to, to, that, to those <coughs> possibilities. Think strategically. <clears throat> really, foresight is being strategic, so that's redundant in a way, but let me read you what I've got on this. Don't take a, a, a head-down approach to life. Don't go flying through life, looking down at what you're doing, and not noticing what's going on around you. And what I mean by going on around you is everything that you're doing is, is, uh, it, it has connections to the world. Yeah. You know, if, if you're, if you're a, uh, I don't want, why do I want to say yoga teacher? Uh, <laughs> if whatever it is you're doing, other people are doing it. Something like it. Not the way you're doing it, but they're doing it. Things out there. There are journals. There are things online you can read and learn. There's new information because people are coming up with different ways to do things. You need to know about that. And strategic thinking has to do with that. Find and apply key information that can help you focus, prioritize, and be proactive in knowing what's happening around you so that you can impact where you're going with that information. Being strategic is like knowing what's going on. So you're the expert. You're the expert beyond what you're doing. You know what else is doing. I was writing a book at one point, and, and a uh, publishing house, uh, no, it was an agent, 
sent me a list of questions to think about. And one of them was, who else is doing something like this? Who else is writing a book like this? I had to go to bookstores and get online and look and see who was writing. I didn't even think about that. But that's an important thing to know. It's kind of like, who's your competitors? You don't know who, you're, who, who out there is doing that. I tell you, I was shocked when I wrote my book on treatment, and two other books on treatment came out immediately before mine. Yeah, of course. Really? <laughs> 60 years, no books, and two of them are going to come out right as I'm publishing? No problem. My book was better. <laughs> but it's important to know that stuff. It's important to pay attention to what's going on. It's important to make your choices based on a well-informed body of knowledge that you put together about what you're doing. Nobody's really going to be successful on their own. We're really going to do that by engaging what's out there. It's important to do that. Figure out what you don't know, and that will help you. Speak with authority when you talk about your intended outcomes. That's thinking strategically. I am accomplishing this end. I'm doing this. This is what's important to me. Speak with confidence about that. Okay, we're getting there. Regularly review your progress. That's the reason to have short-range goals or short-range outcomes. I'll use that word goal. Because you've got to assess if you're on track. And I guarantee you along the way that change is going to happen and things are going to look different. And that thing that you wrote down a year ago about where you would be now may not be valid anymore. It may be really different. You may have learned some stuff. You've moved in a, a, in a slightly different direction or you've modified or refined what you're doing. That's part of knowing where you are. That's having foresight. That's paying attention to what's going on. And the final one is celebrate everyone, no matter how large or how small. Do something to say, yay, I got past this one, I did this one. Without exception, always celebrate your wins. And let them, let them be the thing that lifts you up. That's it. <laughs> Hello again, this is John. I'm really glad that you're back with me for just a minute here. Before we end up, uh, I want to thank you for coming. I'm trusting that something wonderful came to you through this uh, class uh, that you've just experienced and that you can make that work in your life. So just to end the class on, on the idea that there are things that are looking for us every bit as much as we're looking for them. Let's do our increased income treatment together again. I, John, know that God is the source of all supply and that money is God in action. I know that my good is here now. I am so rich and so full that I have an abundance of money to spare and to share today and always. I know that true prosperity includes perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect happiness. This word which I speak in faith knowing now activates universal law and I accept the results. I bless all that I have now, and I bless the increase. I bless all the others in the increased income program of our class, and I know that we now prosper together in every way. I give thanks for this good, and so it is. Yes. So do that treatment every day, and look around and see how your life is getting better, and tell me about it, and have a fantastic week. I'll see you again soon.